Hi everyone, I'm JD from Willow Bound Journals and this is a junk journal with me episode working in my art junk journal. I've recently done a flip through of this journal, what I've done so far in it on my channel and just sharing the different ways that I like to use it. I use collage, I draw in it, I paint in it, I put photos in there. So it's a bit of a mix of everything, junk journaling, art journaling, scrapbooking, photo album, just a place to write down my thoughts and feelings and things that I'm learning and yeah I really really love using this journal it's possibly my favorite one that I've ever used so far just because of the way that I'm using it it's all just blank cream pages because I like to add my pieces on top of those pages without worrying about things that I'm covering up so I'm just flipping to the next double page spread that is blank and today I'm going to be journaling about some of the books that I'm reading and some of the books that I really want to read. <laughs> so I've got here my little vintage box that I absolutely love. I've had this ever since I was a little kid and passed down in the family. So kind of sentimental and I love that I can use it for storage, for using my vintage ephemera and scrapbook papers and pretty pieces that I collect. Often it's just got the scrap off cuts from previous projects, but there's all sorts of things in there. There's vellum, there's napkins, there's wrapping paper, tissue paper, there is vintage music paper, ledger paper, there's some of my random paintings and watercolors that I've done, there's some doily, what else is in their book pages, all sorts of things are in this box and it's just like my, my go-to box when I want to do a page spread and I want to lay down a background or I want to do some collage. I'm, I'm just looking through here to pick out pieces that go with the theme. So I'm looking for some book pages and I'm also then looking for some blank papers that I can use for my writing space. And so I thought the ledger paper would work really well for that and the backs of book pages or you know those end papers of books that are blank. So I'm using, pulling anything out that I think could work well with this page and I'm obviously pulling out way too much. I'm not going to be using all of it but it's just you know giving me some options and this is half the fun. <laughs> half the fun is just rummaging through all of the things that I've kept and obviously I've kept them because they mean something to me and choosing those pieces and actually finally using them that's really really exciting so you'll watch me now kind of try and lay out a bit of a background and I cover up quite a lot of the cream paper I do leave um, maybe the tiniest little gaps here and there uh, but most of it yeah is covered up with these book pages either blank ones or um, lined paper or a little bit has I used I end up using a book page that has some poetry on it like a really old vintage book that I got from an op shop once um, and it worked really well because on one of those poetry pages that I ripped up to add to the page it says I'm gathering all my books I was like wow look at that <laughs> I didn't actually notice that until I'd stuck it down. So I love it when things like that happen. Little details just coming together. Anyway, um, I also have got a bunch of other book cutouts that I had kept just in my stash, collected. Um, a lot of them come from Daphne's Diary magazine. Anytime there's illustrations or pictures of books in that magazine, my favourite magazine, I cut them out and I... Yeah, just store them ready to be used for a day when I'm going to be journaling about books because I love books so there will always be times when I'll be journaling about books. I also have um, a little cutout from Daphne's Diary that says a book is a gift you can open again and again and it has an illustration of an open book and then I've got two pieces that also came from Olivia from the Brown Satchel. We did a happy mail swap and in her package there was a stamped book um, cutout. So definitely wanted to use that. Actually, I'm not sure if the 
there's another piece here. I can't quite remember where it came from. I think it was Olivia, but if it wasn't, um, my apologies. I can't remember where that one came from. But it says ex libris, libris. I'm not sure what what it um how you say it, <laughs> but I just put that one on there too. That was a sticker. And yeah, so you'll see me kind of uh, play around getting the right layout, overlapping the pieces, filling in the gaps as much as possible, and then adding on the coloured illustrations over the top, while well, some of them are black and white too. And then all in the blank spaces on the, both pages, that's where I do my journaling. So let me share about what I journaled about. So first of all, I really wanted to do this page spread specifically so that I could write about the excitement that I had about reading some books by Irvin Yalom. So he is a psychologist or a psychotherapist who I know from Psychology in Seattle. So that's the podcast that I am a patron and member of. And yeah, I've heard his name quite a lot because Kirk talks about him quite a lot. Um, and then they mentioned this one book called Love's Executioner and a chapter from that book and it sounded really interesting the thing that I was most interested about was the fact that they were saying uh, this guy he was with his client and he was writing in the book about the own thoughts that go that were going on in his head while he was with the client and how sort of that's an opportunity for him as the psychotherapist to learn about himself learn about the client and like therapy isn't just this is something I've learned through Psychology and Settle. It's not just, um, I don't know, the person talks and you tell them how to fix their problems. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a lot of the therapy comes from the actual relationship between the therapist and the client rather than what is said or heard, but it's the relationship dynamic. Um, and so it was really interesting how... Yeah, it's ha when the psychotherapist becomes aware or the clinician or whoever therapist becomes aware of their what's going on inside of them as their client is with them, that clues them in to things that is important to know about the client. So it's not just you're hearing what they're saying and then only using that as information to help them but it's listening to your own body, listening to what's going on in your own thoughts and feelings when you're with the client, because that can tell you some things about maybe how they were raised and maybe their schemas. I don't know. <laughs> Not sure if I'm getting this right. But for example, um, there was this book I read called The Examined Life, and it was amazing. I loved it so, so much. One of the people in the Psychology and Seattle fan page recommended it. And that's, this book really highlights that dynamic, how it's not just, oh, here's the client talking about this and then the um, therapist says this back to them and then they were helped. No, it's here's the client saying and doing these things and the therapist realising, oh, I'm getting quite anxious listening to them or I'm feeling really uneasy or I'm really feeling scared or I feel a need to mother them and them noting that in themselves and that cluing them into, oh, maybe this person, when they were a child and growing up, um, they mothered others or, or they needed to be mothered or, or something. I don't know, I'm probably getting it all wrong again, but uh, it was just so fascinating. Um, one time, I, the story in one of the chapters was something about this guy felt socialised into, um, oh, I can't remember the exact thing, um, but it was really key. It gave him an insight into something about this client's background. Um, anyway, I, I think that's fascinating. I think that's absolutely fascinating. And I love that book so much. So when Kirk was talking about Love's Ex Executioner, the way, and he was talking with Bob, another co-host, the way they were talking about it made me think, oh, this actually sounds similar to The Examined Life. And I was hoping that there'd be other books like The Examined Life out there because it was amazing, but I hadn't found any. So I thought, oh, maybe there's none out there. So when they were talking about this one, I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds like it could be similar. So I went to Amazon and I looked it up, read the blurb, and it does sound very similar. It's 
like 10 cases of psychotherapy. I think obviously they change details about the client to protect confidentiality and all that kind of stuff. But they talk about their sessions with 10 different clients or something and what is going through their own mind with while they're with them and how that is part of the therapy. And I think that is so fascinating, so, so fascinating, so interesting and so amazing. So I am so excited to read Love's Executioner. And then I looked up more of Irvin Yalom's books and he's got another one uh, that's similar to this, another one with 10 cases of psychotherapy. And then he's got one called The Gift of Therapy or The Gifts of Therapy. And it's like a book that I, I believe that sums up his main principles of therapy or something. And I, was, I read a little um, snippet of it from the free sample. And again, I was just like, oh my gosh, this looks amazing. Um, so I am so keen to read these books. Um, but the thing is, I already have like two, four, six books on the go. And I even had eight books no, wait, I've got four books on the go currently and I did have six books on the go a few days ago. But what I've decided is I will not buy any Irvin Yalom books until I finish these books that I already have going. So I finished two already. Yay! Yay! That's progress. Um, and I'm making my way through two others. One's fiction and one's non-fiction. So I often will read a non-fiction and fiction at the same time because depending on what mood I'm in, I'll, um, I'll pick up the fiction or the non-fiction. Um, so I'm making my way through those. I've got maybe like 10 pages to go on one. So I'm almost through with that one. And the other one, I, I, it's the fiction one. So you can read that pretty quickly. And, um, I, I reckon I'll get that one done. So even if I just get those two done, cause the other two, I am not that fast about finishing. Um, but these two, I definitely want to finish. <laughs> Um, and so once I finish these two, I am going to dive into the world of Irvin Yellen. And I was checking up about him as well. And I found out he is an existential psychotherapist, which no wonder I related to his books when I read the free samples. Cause, um, out of like, I love learning about psychology and therapy um, but what I've learned is I resonate a lot with the existential therapists or therapy and because that's just me. <laughs> You've maybe heard a lot of my rambles on my channel about me thinking about existentialism and how that is one of my um, struggles in life, but also one of my joys. I love thinking about it <laughs> and it fascinates me so much. So existential therapy looking forward to reading about an existential therapist's books anyway moving on i'll talk about these other books because that's what i wrote about on this right hand side page but on the left hand side page i wrote about the books that i was currently reading at the time um and the ones and i finished some of those already by now um so one of those was called reasons to stay alive by matt haig great book really enjoyed it um, one of the biggest things I got out of it was this one line where he said that he often felt or he something it was either referring to himself or people in general that some people will go through life feeling lonely because they always feel like no one else is on the same wavelength as them and I was like oh as soon as I read that line I was like yes that that's me um, and because Matt Haig, he, he was talking about how he has all these deep thoughts about life and existence and um, self-discovery and all that kind of stuff. And, and yeah, that's what he was referring to when he was talking about going through life lonely because people aren't on the same wavelength as him as a deep thinker. And I'm like, yes, that's me. I'm always thinking about existentialism and the universe and how we fit into it and all that kind of stuff and knowing yourself more and all that kind of stuff. And it can feel a bit lonely um, going through life when you're thinking like this and those around you don't want to talk about this stuff or have maybe never thought about it or don't have any interest in thinking about it, let alone talking about it. Um, but that's me. And I was like, yay, uh, Matt Haig, I'm with you. We can be lonely together. <laughs> but just knowing he said that made me feel less alone. And that's the thing. When you read books by people, 
it helps helps you know you're not alone so if he's out there like that and I'm like this then there's definitely other people like us as well and just you're not alone you're not alone (laughs) I'm on your wavelength (laughs) and you know what I mean when I say that (laughs) if you're one of those people um another book that I finished just recently was called notes to myself by Hugh Prather and again, this was another very deep thinking philosophical book. I love those types of books because I'm I'm deep thinking and I'm philosophical um, by nature, and it's how I spend my time. It's I love just thinking about philosophy, <laughs> um, and so reading a book about it, about this guy's deep thoughts, is like reading my own thoughts. And obviously, he has some you know different thoughts, but the ones that overlap again, it makes me feel like ah, oh, you've put this into words when no one else has said it, and you're putting into words what I feel and think and yeah that was really really cool one of the biggest things I got out of it was when he said the biggest crime we commit is the crime of normality this idea that we all have to have it all together because that's what's normal but no one has it all together (laughs) so why do we pretend that we have it all together it's because of this thing that we portray that it has this is normal it's normal um but then it makes us feel like, well, then I have to pretend I have it all together because that's what's normal. But if we can all just be like, no, no one has it all together. We're all messes. We all struggle. <laughs> we all are clueless and, <laughs> and confused in life. Um, and if we can let our pain and our struggles be known and like have that be an everyday reality instead of going, nope, I've got it all together. I'm strong. Grin and smile and bear it. Um, because then that just makes people feel so alone and makes people believe a lie and yeah imagine yeah if we could all just not have it together every single person because that's reality (laughs) um and this was a key line i got out of it too boredom is thinking the same thoughts boredom is not the same circumstances over and over again boredom is thinking the same thoughts I was like oh that's a bit challenging oh it's a bit convicting isn't it (laughs) so to have new thoughts that's a challenge I want to have new thoughts about the same situation and see the joy and the treasure in the same same old same old um and if we achieve two seconds of peace in a day that is amazing that was another little key insight he was talking about how he rarely has moments of peace in a day because you know he's worrying about and it's not like major worry it's just like you know, maybe a one out of ten on the scale of worry but always thinking about am I doing this right what's this person thinking of me am I being a good enough husband am I being enough good enough um friend like thoughts that he's having constantly constant constantly and I'm like that's me as well <laughs> I if I have two seconds of peace in any day I'm, I'm wow <laughs> and to know like there's no judgment there's no shame if you're like that too um because there's other people out there who go through life like that too. It's not a bad existence. He's not saying it's a terrible existence because of this. It's just like, no, I don't have to pretend either that it's not like this, that this isn't the way it is. Um, anyway, so reading thoughts like that, it's like, oh, this is great. Hearing someone else say thoughts that I can relate to and know that I'm not alone and that there's no shame or judgment in it, that we can just claim it and be like, yep, this is how I am. And it doesn't make my existence bad. It doesn't make it worse than anyone else's. In fact, I quite like my existence the way that it is. But to, just to acknowledge that there are struggles too. But just because there's struggles doesn't mean it's a bad existence. That I can embrace these struggles and that I can um, know that they're normal. That they're okay to have. And that they don't have to go away. Uh, yeah, so... I love love reading these types of books and looking forward to reading Irvin Yellum's books. I'm sure I'll get some more insights from it. Um, I'm just going to flip to another page here, as you can see, and I am writing about another book on this page. About I've talked about this one a lot on my channel from the book First We Make the Beast Beautiful by Sarah Wilson. This insight that some people look at flowers and simply enjoy flowers but I look at flowers and I think deeply about them. I wrestle with them. I wonder, am I looking at it right? What do I need to learn from this? Um, what does this flower mean? How did it even get here? <laughs> and I get all existential about looking at flowers. Um, and at first I was like, oh man, I need to be more like people who just enjoy flowers. But it's like, no, I don't actually. This is the way I am. This is the way that I'm wired. This is the way that I'm made. And I actually kind of like it. I like wrestling with flowers. So I hope you enjoyed that video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.